Hello everyone, I'm The Enforcer and welcome to the breaking news. Today's breaking news is that President Vladimir Putin has admitted defeat of Russian forces within the Kharkiv Oblast as he has now changed the determinant of the offensive into one that was only simply creating a barrier region within the border zone. This statement came out just hours ago from uh, President Putin and he has largely admitted that the offensive is a failure through more uh, colorful language. According to the direct quote from this video right here, Putin stated that what is happening in the Kharkiv region is a fault of the Ukrainian authorities and a clear response to the shelling of the border regions in Russia. He also stated that the Istanbul agreements are only the basis for a possible negotiation with Ukraine. This statement by President Putin would sound very on the surface of face value would sound a lot like he is saying that they were only attempting to create a border zone or more so a buffer zone with the Russian Federation. The only issue is, is that they're not. If we look at the offensive map and currently where Russian forces are at the moment, we can see that the Russians have only moved into the area of Plina and also outside of Vovchansk. The Russian border zone is practically non-existent, if this is the border zone that he claims there is. It is, at its deepest, about 6.7 kilometers deep, and considering that Ukrainian missile and artillery attacks can still occur on Belgorod or any other part of the Russian Federation in this area, south of Belgorod, this is doing absolutely nothing to create any kind of an effective border zone or a barrier zone where Ukrainian artillery cannot fire onto Belgorod. Not only that, but this buffer zone doesn't even exist throughout most of the border. It only exists in the area of Vovchansk and Plina. It does not exist anywhere near the major highway, the E-30. It does not exist anywhere in the Sumy regions as well, which are about as close to Belgorod as any other part of the border, or even down in the area of Beliki Kolodaya. So we don't see anything down there either. And going off of that, this was clearly a attempt by Putin to change the story of what this offensive was supposed to be achieving after the fact. We already know that the offensive was largely supposed to conduct some kind of a major breakthrough. We've already seen that NATO analysts believed up until this point that there was going to be an attempt at a breakthrough, whether it was going to be highly or likely or not, was really what was up to the question. No one was looking at this offensive and saying that it was simply to create a buffer zone. Putin has practically admitted defeat with the statement. Um, there's really no other way to look at it because the situation on the ground is showing that this was an attempt at an actual serious frontline offensive to move towards the area of Kharkiv and possibly take the city. If it was an attempt at a buffer zone, the front would have been much wider and not only that, there would have been a lot less troop density only wanting to create an actual barrier zone instead of trying to create a specific uh, heavily dense front line where Russian troops would be attempting to punch through Ukrainian lines. So going off of this, Putin has rephrased the story of the offensive, and therefore we clearly know at this point that this is a defeat for the Russian Federation. The Russians already realized that the uh, that the momentum behind their offensive forces in Kharkiv had petered out, and there will be no further potential, even in a possible level, for them to try and move their forces uh, in a more uh, successful way against the Ukrainian defenses and towards the city of Kharkiv. Moving on from that, we also got additional news from the area showing that Starlink was apparently down on the day that the offensive began, according to Nexta. Starlink terminals were out of service for armed forces of Ukraine soldiers on the day of the Russian offensive in Kharkiv, according to the Washington Post. The publication reports that on the morning of May 10th, communication with the drones just disappeared. All video feeds were lost, and the unit commander said at some point, we were left completely blind. And this is once again showing that Starlink may possibly be interfered with, and... It may be, so that way the Russians can get an upper hand advantage. Nevertheless, it didn't really prove to be any kind of an upper hand advantage, as Russian forces took incredibly high losses on the first day of the offensive and are still taking record high losses in this front as of today. That's another thing that's been leading us to believe that this is certainly not an attempt at creating a barrier region, because Russian offensive losses in the Kharkiv offensive have been as high, if not higher, than any average day in the Battle of Evdivka. And considering that this is occurring over loosely dense, uh, well, loosely or densely populated countrysides, this was once again showing that the Russians had put a large amount of troop concentrations in this area and were once again trying to force a breakthrough of the Ukrainian lines in this region and possibly threaten Kharkiv or threaten the Ukrainian rear lines in the northeastern part of the country, west of Kupiansk and kupiansk Vaslovi. This is all showing, and there's really, in, you know, and people may agree or disagree, and I'll be entirely honest with you, all people will of course disagree. But this offensive was an absolute failure, and the fact that Putin had to come out today and clarify what this offensive was for, and say that it was only to create a mere border zone, although we already know that there are 30,000 Russian ground troops engaged in an offensive with such a small scope, a really small area of coverage, 
That is clearly showing us that that statement was a complete lie. And Russia is now trying to, well, specifically Putin, is now trying to remarket the offensive so that way it doesn't look like an unmitigated and absolute failure. This is the Russian equivalent of a Gallipoli. And meanwhile, the Ukrainians are already beginning to destroy Russian supply lines, behind the lines, by hitting nearby fuel stations close to the front. In this area, considering that there is a large amount of civilian infrastructure that is usable and within Russian territory, we do know that the Russians are refueling and running a large amount of their armored vehicles out of local gas stations. And from what we, under from what we understand, this is either a local gas station or a small fuel depot that is used to distribute gas to the gas stations. This means that the Russians will probably have to start pulling in gas or using logistical uh, forces to supply them with fuel trucks so that way they can try and keep the offensive vehicles of the Russian um, the Russian Harky front in Vovchansk, the area around the village of, uh, let me make sure I got the name correct, Bukhra Vodka, and also the area around Plina to try and keep them running. Once again, making the Russian supply situation far more difficult. Meanwhile, up in the area of the Sumi border region, we did see that a small number of Russian tanks were spotted, and it appears that they may have been trying to do some engineering works to clear a path for Russian vehicles in the future, but they were stricken and destroyed. This may be showing that the Russians were serious about trying to create a barrier region, but once again, if they really were, they wouldn't give the Ukrainians a heads up by advancing on Vovchansk and into Plina, completely separate from the rest of the offensive, they would have advanced on the entire front as one, trying to overwhelm the Ukrainians on a large and wide front line so that way they couldn't concentrate their troops uh, well or in a, lar in a very small area. We can see that one of the Russian tanks had already been destroyed and more FPV drones began flying in to knock out the remainder of the Russian vehicles that were now stuck within this improvised crossing over the small elevation feature. Suffice it to say, this offensive has been conducted quite poorly by the Russians. It's a very lackluster offensive. Uh, it appears that it's very uh, well uncoordinated. It has poor supply line access, and not only that, it really lost the element of surprise once it slowly moved into Ukraine, into Plina, and also right across the border from Vovchansk over the first two days, with really no offensive progress being made for those 48 hours. Overall, this offensive was a complete failure. There's really no other way for me to put it, and it will come out in the later days and weeks how much of a failure this really was, but giving our current analysis in the moment, knowing what this offensive has looked like over the past seven days, and now seeing what it's turned into, Putin has in his statement today, and I have to keep on coming back to this and circling back to it, he's admitted defeat. Um, it's showing that the Russians have no larger scale for this offensive. They already know that they couldn't achieve it, uh, and that's why he made the statement so that way when the Russians do not achieve anything much larger than what they've done already, it doesn't look as though it was a complete failure. It looks like they actually achieved what they were going for, but that was not the case. Moving on from that, and out of the Kharkiv area, we were able to hear that Ukraine conducted the largest attack, the largest drone attack of the war on the Russian Federation and ended up critically damaging and destroying Russian naval infrastructure within the port of Novorossiysk and also the oil refineries within Tuops and maybe have even striked the airport in, in Stavropol and Stavropol Cry. We're going to be moving on into the area of Novorossiysk first as we got to see that drones kept coming in. According to this Russian camera person, he said that 20 drones had already passed over him and they were not stopping. We know that this attack was made up of exactly 80 Lyuti drones. And we can see one of those in this clip right here. Вот эта вся нечисть летит в сторону элеватора, в сторону порта, короче, побережья туда, на терминалы гахают там, блядь, и ПВО работает. Короче, жесть, вот они подряд идут, суки. Просто, просто мрак какой-то, вот он, козел. И вон следом еще один, три подряд. Вот они летят, они не переставая, рой летит и все. We see another one flying over. And it's just an endless stream of them. That's the end of that clip, and meanwhile, in the port of Navarisisk, hell broke out. 
this was by far the largest attack that we've seen of the war and the damage was severe. I'm going to be showing you all different perspectives of the drone strikes that occurred in Novorossiysk because we understood that last night, according to preliminary information, that the Ukrainians had stricken the fueling terminal for the port of Novorossiysk, which allows for the Russian Navy to be able to operate out of it. And I'll show you all how. These fuel terminals here are connected to a large amount of pipe works that then travel through the port area over one rail yard and then down into the port itself right here. This is where the Russian Navy is able to fuel its vessels, as the actual area of Vostochny Rayon, or the Russian naval wharf inside of this harbor, does not have any fueling access here, and it does not have any fueling silos that are accessible for the Navy to use, completely exclusive of the rest of the port. This means that any Russian naval uh, vessel that operates off of diesel or any other kind of uh, naval fuels has to get it from this fuel terminal right here at this part of the port. With this being knocked out, we know that the Russian Black Sea Fleet will not be able to operate operate out of Sevastopol or out of Novorossiysk with any kind of efficiency whatsoever and may as well have been knocked out of the war at this point. But we also see that many different attacks also occurred as well and I'm going to be showing you all these clips starting off with this one right here. What's this? We see the drones impacting the port of Novorossiysk and continuing to destroy Russian infrastructure. And that's the end of the clip right there, but moving on into our next clip from the port, we were also able to see additional strikes occurring in the area. Now this one here we might actually be able to geolocate on air because we have these four large funnels uh, or more so smokestacks that are a part of a factory and we believe that this factory may be the one that we see right here. It may be. Meaning that this camera is actually looking from the northern area south and this also means this may be targeting the Stochny Rayon itself not just the fueling harbor uh, further north. But here's the clip. Come on, come on, come on. Да, вот я прям видел его. Полетел, полетел. Вот он. Ну, you see an impact right there. Dead on hit. Moving on into our third clip, we were also able to see... Это точно сейчас пизда. More so in the daylight, as the drones were still coming in at this point by the time it was reaching daytime. Вот он, вот он, вот он летит. Я его вижу. Сейчас он будет пиздожить. Нихуя, он сейчас падает. Another drone flying in. Пиздец. And it is another target with a novices. Гандоны ебаные. Это точно сейчас пиздец. And moving on into our final clip, we were also able to see, right here, another attack that occurred inside of Novorossiysk. This one was uh, earlier on, one of the first attacks that hit Novorossiysk, uh, Novorossiysk in the middle of the night. We can see the Russians firing off anti-air defenses. Another thing, another thing I would like y'all to know is that the Russian anti-air defense seems to be mostly made up of AKs and machine guns and really no larger caliber air defense or any kind of high-tech air defense, meaning that its efficiency is extremely diminished, next to none. Налет хороший, похоже. Налет сильный, довольно -таки. We see the air defense continuing to fire, but we don't see any impacts or shooting downs of drones over the city of Novorossiysk. Well, from what we understand, several Ukrainian drones did end up getting shot down during the air attack on Novorossiysk, but the number was incredibly small. Out of the 80 drones that flew in, we've heard that maybe about four of them were shot down by Russian air defense, meaning that the interception rates are abysmally low. Some of the lowest Ukrainian interception rates seen against Russian drones were around 40%. This right now is hovering around the area of about 
maybe 5% or 7%, somewhere around that area, which means that this is one of the lowest interception rates that we've ever seen. Not only that, some of the drones flew directly over Navarsisk and straight down the coastline and into the town of Chawaps, where some of these drones ended up hitting another major oil refinery and knocking it out. Here's the clip. We well, see one of the Liuti drones right here flying on into the area of the oil refinery. We hear some sporadic air defense fire as the drone now tilts down to the refinery, impacting it and knocking it out. And that's the end of that clip right there, but once again showing the serious damage caused by the Ukrainian drones overnight. And then finally we saw that a fire occurred at the Stavropol airport in Stavropol Cry. We do not know what caused this fire. It may be possible that it was some kind of a Ukrainian attack or drone, but at the moment the source of the fire is currently unknown. The Ukrainian Ministry of Defense stated that the drone attacks of last night, of course the largest that the Ukraine has ever conducted of the war, of 80 Liuti drones being fired from Ukrainian territory and into the areas of the southern Russian Don and Caucasus Mountain regions, the Ministry of Defense has stated that the attempt was to show that the Russians have absolutely no air defense and the Russian Federation is completely vulnerable to Ukrainian deep strikes with drones. It appears that that is entirely the case, as most of these drones were not shot down, and the damage is incredibly severe, on a strategic perspective. While at the moment we do not understand that any Russian naval warships were destroyed overnight, we do know that their ability to refuel and operate from the port of Novorossiysk has been completely disabled, as the fueling terminals are now completely out of action. With the silos being destroyed, we now understand that there's either going to be a very limited amount of fuel to be used in the port, or there will be none. Meaning that while the Russian Navy may be safe in Novorossiysk, any further naval actions will, are not permissible given the current conditions inside of the harbor. Not only that, but the city of Tuops, further south and along the area of the Russian coastline, and I believe, if I'm correct, Tuops is right here, and the Ula refinery is right up here as well, also being knocked out means that oil production is once again being greatly hampered by the Ukrainians, or really refined fuel product production is being greatly hampered by the Ukrainians, and we would highly expect that the Russian Federation will once again be reeling as they continue to hemorrhage large amounts of usable fuel products in the hundreds of thousands of barrels per day, most likely running out of these fuel reserves by the later end of this year or the very beginning of next year. The situation is incredibly grave for the Russian Federation overall, as we now see that the Ukrainians largely are able to control the skies not over Ukraine, but also inside the Russian Federation with our deep strike attacks. And not only that, within the region of Kharkiv, we're already seeing that the Russian Federation is having to scale back their expectations of their offensive and practically admit defeat, based off of what we would have believed to be their original offensive goals due to the withering defense and high casualties that have been sustained from the Ukrainian forces. This is all once again showing that the Russians are really in the end phase of the war as these acts of desperation and these devastating blows are all going to be culminating more so towards the war ending probably by the end of this year or the very beginning of next year. But with that, that is all of the breaking news that we have today. I've got to thank each and every one of y'all so much once again for watching uh, this news. If y'all did enjoy, please make sure to like, comment, and subscribe and support this uh, channel on Patreon. The link is in the description below. And I got to give a massive shout out to everyone who's already on Patreon because y'all helped to make this channel possible and help me and Enforcer Matt to be able to do this for a living. And of course, we will see you all in the next.